Hello and welcome to a brand new show called iBuzz. I'm your host, Noshin Bukhari, with some favorite entertainment news that you've been looking for. First things first, let me take you to the top stories of the day. Roger Waters and Tom Morello to perform in an online benefit concert for Palestinian musicians in Gaza. Hollywood Bowl Los Angeles Summer Staple announces reopening plans. LeBron James morphs into Looney Tunes character in Space Jam, A New Legacy. Friends reunion shoot apparently underway as Matthew Perry makes revealing Instagram posts. The Falcon and The Winter Soldier aired on Disney+. Plus. Coming to the top story of the day, Friends reunion shoot apparently underway as Matthew Perry makes revealing in Instagram post. Perry has confirmed the news that the Friends cast reunion is on. Perry posted a photo on Instagram Friday night of himself in a makeup chair. He joked, not to mention reuniting with my friends. The photo was quickly taken down, but the damage was done as fans rejoiced at the apparent good news. Several fans captured screenshots of the post and it spread virally after that. To discuss this further, we have Matt Capon with us, who is a senior entertainment journalist at, at Daily Mail. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. So Matt, are you excited? Just tell us about the reunion. What, did, what was the first thought that came into your mind when you heard about the Friends reunion? Well, there's huge expectation for it. Friends was an iconic part of everyone's lives during the 1990s. Hmm. And the cast have been very evasive. They, we haven't seen all of the Central Perk gang back together for a very long while, barring perhaps yeah. the small reunion that we saw um, last year in 2020 between hmm. um, the ladies of Friends. But to get the whole team back together, I think it's going to make a hmm. lot of 90s kids very, very happy indeed. Yeah. And what are your expectations that what could possibly be uh, made in order to make it acceptable for, for maximum audiences? Because as we've seen over the years, the, the entire scenario for sitcoms has been changed. So what, what are your expectations this time from Friends? Well, I think they've got to be very, very, they've got to be very, very careful. You can't, you can't go over old ground. People will very, yeah. will judge it from the, by the past. So they've got to present something new. They've got to present something fresh. But as we've seen, these reunions, these nostalgia driven hmm. programs really do strike a chord, chord with people. I think to keep it fresh, let's hear about the stories of the actors. Let's right. see what they think about where the characters have been in the time since we last saw them on the screen. Hmm. Um, also, uh, it is speculated that the post was immediately turned down once uh, Chandler revealed that there is a, a, a possible reunion. Do you think this can be a trick to create a trap for viewers or to create you know, ma maximum viewership for, for uh, people to watch Friends once again and to anticipate it? I, I think to a certain extent, but I think what is uh, more likely is if you look at how the cast have reacted to the news, they've all been incredibly excited themselves. Mm. And I think as we saw when Jennifer Aniston arrived on Instagram and allegedly broke the internet yeah. because people people really weren't expecting it, I think they themselves are, exci are excited. And I wouldn't blame Matthew Perry for making the, making the post on Instagram as he did because I understand that that was quite a special group of people. So who wouldn't be excited? It's entirely human. Right. So uh, Friends enjoyed a good amount of 10 years time on screen. Do you think, Matt, that such sort of reunions are required in this era? Or do you think that they could have come up with something new, uh, keeping the same cast? Uh, well, it, it didn't work with the Joey spin-off. Um, yeah. I think what you've, ha you've had with Friends is it was lightning in a bottle. It was something very magical that struck a chord with everyone and was very much of its time. To do something new with those characters, I don't think would really chime 
we've seen spin-offs of that ilk not really be as successful as their predecessor. So I think this is very much going to be an exploration in nostalgia, a revisiting of familiar friends that we all remember on screen when we were growing up. And I think it will really be a demonstration of really adulthood, how these characters have grown and matured, but how the actors portray it. Mm. Because again, remember, this isn't a special episode, really. It yeah. is a documentary of sorts. Right. So Matt, tell us about yourself that which one of these characters had been your ever favorite when you used to watch Friends? I've been compared to Chandler on more than one occasion. <laughs> um, and I still am in many, many respects. Um, I always I always uh, recognized where Chandler's head, head was at. But you could always find you could always find something <laughs> recognizable in those characters, especially of course when they had the Friends special that came over to London. That made it particularly mm -hmm. special. So, um, Matt, in your opinion, what could be the reasons to uh, get this clean humor replaced? I mean, what, when we see uh, sitcoms today, they, they are an entire different, different picture. Uh, Friends, however, was, you know, it, it was taken as a family sitcom. Friends would enjoy it. Families would enjoy it. In, in your opinion, what possible reasons are there to, uh, you know, get these uh, family sitcoms replaced by the ones that we are seeing now, which um, I don't think are recommendable for family and friends. I think what you've, you have to remember that there's a certain level of name recognition when you say friends, when, um, with regards to a TV sitcom, people know it worldwide. So it doesn't just bring new viewers together, it brings older viewers together that might not, have, might not be watching television in the same way anymore as they've grown, as yeah. they've grown up s since the 90s. So to bring people back together, it's really, it's an event. It is, mm. It's an event in, in TV that will bring families around television to see what exactly uh, this mm. is going to look like. They tried it very successfully with uh, Will Smith and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, yeah. but this will be so much more for a worldwide television audience. Yeah. Uh, what, there is also um, uh, another school of thought that thinks that Friends is overrated. I mean, the comedy in Friends is overrated. So what do you think of that school of thought? Do you, do you agree at some point or do you think that it's their own opinion and it doesn't apply on uh, Friends? Friends, in many regards, hasn't aged well. It's very, very true. But you can say that about a lot of different television series that we've enjoyed um, in our youth. It, there are parts of it that just won't translate now to today's audiences. I mean, when Friends originally launched on Netflix, there was a yeah. lot of um, drama around some of the episodes and what this actually meant for today's younger generation, the same generation. Yeah the similar gen generation that watched it when it first aired. So there are some things that just won't translate, but I think that's the nature of comedy. And that is that in many respects, the nature of television, some things will endure and will be timeless, others much less so. Right, and do you think that Friends has, over the over the period of time, it has become a brand? And that is why, um, you, you know, it, it is being marketed that way, because like you, you just uh, said that we have Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, we had a lot of other sitcoms that were, you know, uh, top-notch in their time. But why exclusively Friends? Do you think that they're trying to make it a brand? Of course it has become a brand itself, but do you think that it is, it is a relaunch of the brand this time? I think it'd be more, moreover, it's more a refresh of the brand. It's a reintroduction of the brand to new sets of eyes. You have to remember that the Friends reunion is one of those specials to help launch the streaming service in the US, yeah. HBO Max. It needs to get eyes on its product. So what better way to do it than to find something which, as you say, quite rightly, it is a brand. But it, that brand recognition is going to bring people to the screen to watch um, this reunion episode, but also to reintroduce uh, people to the characters, the idea of Central Perk, the, the coffee shop, mm. and so on and so forth. It is, a, it is a brand, I think it always was a brand, and it's simply presenting it now for mm. a 21st century audience. Right, and are you expecting any experiments? For instance, one of the characters or one of the actors, they refuse to rejoin for some reason. Uh, do you expect for NBC team to do some experiments and bring a replacement for that character? I think you could. I think it's quite likely. I think you. I think you'll find that the production team really they have a, an open an open book really with what they they can do for this.
um, special. It's going to be something where the guys are going to be able to really mm. push the envelope a bit if they choose to, or to be quite nostalgic and quite classic right. in how they're how they're presenting the, the documentary. I mean, even down to the title itself, no one really knows mm. what the title of this show is going to be. So that speculation really leaves us with a level of anticipation which as i said is going to bring people to the content to want to see what exactly they're going to produce it's quite an exciting time really yeah. especially if you're a fan of friends right right and mad what are your own, own personal uh, expectations from this reunion being a fan i think it's going to be quite insightful i hope my expectations really are, i'm excited about yeah. what it's going to what it's going to um, look like, how they're going to deliver it, what the actors say. Let's hear some some of their stories about the characters, what they've yeah. done since. But yeah. my my mind is I, my mind is incredibly open about what the what right. the possibilities could be. I we just don't know, and I think that's the exciting thing, really. Right, right, Matt. Thank you very much for your discussion and your fruitful time with us. Thanks a lot for your time, thank guys. You. Thank you very much. And now we will dig deep into the details of our stories of the day. Roger Waters, Tom Morello and Brian Eno will join a host of Palestinian musicians on Saturday for an online benefit concert dubbed Live for Gaza. The event, which starts at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, will raise funds for Delia Arts Center, a haven for Palestinian musicians in Gaza. Joining the lineup will be acclaimed Palestinian musicians Muhammad Asaf, Adnan Gibran of Lee Trio Gibran, Rala Azar, and Lina Salibi. Performing from Gaza will be Wafa Al Najeli, Badili Band, and Osprey Phi. The Hollywood Bowl is coming back. The famed Hollywood Bowl Amphitheater in Los Angeles announced on Friday it will be reopening this summer. More than one year after, after it closed its gates due to the coronavirus pandemic, the venue said it plans to reopen in May with a limited capacity audience of about 4,000 and hope to increase that as the summer goes on. The normal seating capacity is over 17,000. The first four concerts to be held at the Bowl will be free events sponsored by Kaser, permanent for healthcare workers, first responders and essential workers, as a gesture of thanks for all they have done for Los, Ange for Los Angeles throughout the pandemic. LeBron James morphs into Looney Tunes character in Space Jam, A New Legacy. Just in case you were feeling your age lately, it's been 25 years, a quarter of a century, since the Space Jam movie came out. This year, director Malcolm D. Lee and a creative dream team is bringing Warner Brothers Space Jam back to the big screen with an animated and live-action hybrid sequel, Space Jam, A New Legacy, LeBron James is given the lead character. The Falcon and The Winter Soldier aired on Disney+. Plus. Since fans could not wait for Marvel to show their magic, the team came up with a better solution of screening the superheroes. After the tremendous success of WandaVision, Marvel launched The Falcon and The Winter Soldier Season 1 on Disney+. Plus. The series will feature six episodes in total, and new episodes arrive every Friday. The season finale will debut on April 23rd. That's it from the newsroom. We will be right back after a quick short break. Stay tuned and don't go anywhere. Welcome back. In this segment, we will be discussing the scenario on the underground music. The term underground music has been applied to various artistic movements. For instance, the psychedelic music movement of the mid-1960s. But the term has been, in, in more recent decades, come to be defined by any musicians who tend to avoid the trappings of the mainstream commercial music industry. To discuss this further, we have Shahriyar Mirza on board with us, who is a songwriter, a music composer, and a renowned singer. Shariar, welcome to the show. Hi, good to be on the show, Nasheen. So tell us about the underground music. Why various artists choose this category, uh, uh, provided the fact that they are very talented. Uh, what makes them to choose uh, underground music? 
Okay, so <clears throat> in my experience, what I've noticed is that not every musician wants to sing or cater to the crowd. So mm -hmm. there are a few musicians who feel that they have a more of a niche mm -hmm. uh, market. So like you mentioned, uh, underground is the complete counter narrative of mainstream music. So yeah. you'll always have musicians playing less uh, popular music. And uh, so they, the, the audience they find then is what they call underground. So uh, in a way, they'll never make it by corporate standards. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's still a, it's still a good um, splinter movement. Right. <laughs> Right, and tell us about the struggles of these musicians who choose to play on, uh, you know, in under, underground music category. What are the basic struggles and what measures can be taken to provide a good platform for their uh, craft? So, yeah, the struggle is real. You know, like they say, the struggle is real. I remember back in the mid-90s as a student or, you know, perhaps later when I formed my own band, Soul Slide, um, it was it was really hard everything mm -hmm. from first of all getting gear now yeah. nowadays you still have better access to mu music uh, back then you know it was it was really can you imagine you, that's just yeah. when around the time where pirate music was making a big sort of a napster was there right. but uh, so the struggle is real even now there's always some kind of economic aspect mm -hmm. where you right. get your hands on good gear and then of course patrons of the arts are missing in pakistan the biggest thing is what you need is patronage. Uh, without patronage, you're not going to find uh, mm. these festivals. And so you don't find too many festivals that are underground. So um, so some of the things that people can do in this country is to mm. uh, embrace the you know some of these bands and, and give them uh, some kind of sponsorship uh, right. if possible. Yeah. Right, right. And as a musician yourself, what sort of advice would you give to these underground musicians to sustain their craft? Because we have seen that there are certain musical programs being arranged that bring forth such talent. But then once the, the contests are over, those, those bands are on their own, those musicians are on their own. You being a musician, what advice would you give to these musicians to sustain their craft? Well, uh, the way I used to do it back in the day, it was <clears throat> try, try and get some corporate shows in the middle so just so that we could you know, keep, the, keep the momentum going and, and, and you know, again, uh, the financial aspect is important, so um, try and be a little flexible so that you mm -hmm. can still do a few gigs that pay you. Now, I know that corporate culture might sound like a bad word for a lot of people, but the fact is that um, you need to sustain yourself, you know, <clears throat> do a single jingle if you need to, yeah. but do it so that you can sustain your passion because music is a passion. Um, right. So I would say that, you know, don't lose heart, but also be flexible and, you know, do some commercial work if you can. Yeah. And uh, what what are the possible genres that can be you know more successful when somebody opts to become an underground musician? What would you suggest to go for certain uh, genres? Genres, well, you know, when I grew up, with, uh, Lahore was the hub, you know, and mm -hmm. I, and I had so much respect for bands like Coven and Entity Paradigm, EP Johe Band, and all these great bands, and and, and you know, uh, so it was rock was a big thing, yeah. and. Um, in fact, heavy rock. And then, of course, the onset of the, the you know, what we call the Sweet Leaf jam, um, Jams that happened in Islamabad, mm -hmm. they were all rock bands like Lahu, Surge, uh, my band, and we were all rock bands. Yeah. Um, I, I have seen a lot of uh, electronic EDM music also happening. So I think those are things that people, uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a big, big um, um, future in electronic music. And, 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 and actually, corporates like Red Bull can pick up on it. So. So I, I see that this as being extremes, rock music and then completely electronic music. And they both have their, you know, their right. plus points. Right. And do you think that there is a dire need of musical academies that should be um, maintained by the mainstream artists or if not the mainstream artists, the artists, senior artists who have been playing this music um, um, underground? So do you think that we, we need such sort of academies to polish the new musicians? Or are there already some academies which are working uh, in this cause? Uh, I think <clears throat> there are very few academies. Um, there are, there, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Napa. Napa mm -hmm. in Karachi is, is doing an amazing job in nurturing talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really grassroots stuff. Uh, but I can't say the same for a lot of cities uh, because those are private, it's like these private tuition centers. And, and they're very expensive. And I believe that music should be accessible to all. 
uh, and it should not be an elite phenomena. Uh, yeah. So you either have someone who's really talented, but no one discovers him because okay. he's not rich or influential, or you have someone who's really rich, but he's not very talented. Uh, but you'll see, still end up seeing him on TV. So I would, okay. I would really want to see more, um, more uh, patronage yeah. and more institutions that nurture arts, performing arts, uh, right. including dance. Yeah, right. Dance, yeah. And 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 what about the online performances? Do you think that since pandemic has you know changed the entire scenario upside yeah. down of performances? Yeah. So do you think that online performances can bring a, a major change uh, in a very positive aspect for the this for these musicians? Totally, around the world right now, musicians are suffering so much. Again, it comes down to livelihood because there are no gigs happening, and without gigs, you don't make no money. Um, we all need to adapt, and I think in this uh, COVID situation, everyone is more than happy. No. Uh, they, we're starved for entertainment, so there's no reason why we can't have uh, online festivals. We just need someone to become the catalyst and do it, and people will pay the money. Right. In right. Pakistan, some people just want a free lunch all the time, but the memo needs to go out there that you need to pay and uh, charge them a good premium and a guarantee that people will come hmm. uh, and tune in online virtually. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, Sharia, tell us about the perks of being an underground music musician. We, we have already talked about the struggles, um, all, the, all the hard work that these musicians pay off and then they do not get back the same amount of uh, appreciation that they deserve. But then again, what are the perks because of which these musicians choose to be an underground musician? It really does come down to the love for their craft. It's um, a very fine line, but they do not want to compromise on their craft. And I think that is really something that d deserves respect. Um, and I, I, I can say that because I've known a lot of underground musicians. Some of them transcended and they became commercial artists and mashallah, they did really well. But uh, I think um, what uh, the passion drives them. Um, and it's not like they, they want, uh, everyone wants to be known. You see, this is just vanity, you know, this, yeah. uh, but the fact is that a lot of them will not compromise on their craft. So I think it comes down to their music and to, to, to how much they're invested in their music. Um, you know, uh, in, in many ways, Amir Zaki was an underground artist because, yeah. because after his first album, he just did not get the break he, he deserved. And we all know how great a guitar player he was. And he didn't end up in such a great way. So it was a bit of a sad story. So all I'm trying to say is that your commitment to your craft is very important, uh, but it could be a painful road, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. right. And being a musician yourself, uh, tell us about your journey, that how did you start and where do you see yourself standing now? So obviously I've been a part-time musician. I've always been a media person. So it was a, it was a nice balancing act for me. I really enjoyed whatever time I could give to music and mm. what music could give back to me. So, um, you know, started off with a cover band called Soul Slide. And mm. that was really just our way of paying our tribute to the Beatles and, you know, the blues and, and all the great bands like Led Zeppelin and all that we grew up yeah. in uh, listening to. Um, and so that was pretty cool. But I, uh, very early on, I realized personally that I wanted to write my own song. So right. I've, I've been very blessed, mashallah, over the years, I've been putting out a pretty solid body of my own work. Mm -hmm. uh, I always write and compose my own songs in both English and Urdu. So right. I feel that that's something that I can say is very important because original songs are very important and people uh, right. should probably uh, explore that much more. It's very easy to become a cover mm -hmm. artist. So I, I feel that as a songwriter, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's been a very interesting journey for me. And I, I'm going to, inshallah, continue doing that, uh, writing my own songs uh, as Sherry Yar Mirza, as right. my solo. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and tell us about the, the videos. What roles do videos play uh, in order to support a musician, especially a, mu a musician who, who struggles with the, with the lyrics, just like you said, that you've been writing your lyrics on your own, uh, you've been maintaining your music on your own. So a, a musician like you, how important it is for them to have videos um, in order to promote their work? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, you know, uh, with all the clutter that's happening with social media, uh, your video becomes, a, a, I would say, a visiting card. It gives right. people a, because it's so easy to swipe something that these days and yeah. say, nah, it's not for me. Um, so we, uh, more, more now, I mean, I think now more than ever, <laughs> 
uh, people are fighting for, for eyeballs because there's yeah. just too much uh, content out there. So, um, so in every genre, everyone's fighting for space, media space, and mm. and so uh, your music video essentially becomes a good preview, um, and it's also a whole package. It's how you look, mm. it's what the video is about, it's how stylized the video is, and so it's it's interesting. It's a, I would call it a five minute advert. It's an advert. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. And uh, of course, uh, it is an era of monetization. How do you see monetization helping musicians, especially on online platforms yeah. where they perform? Fantastic. It's so important. It's so important. Um, um, I'll take an example of someone like Adil Umar, who has, again, he's a niche artist, um, a rap artist, um, and he uh, monetizes his um, YouTube. And I remember how much he suffered when YouTube yeah. was actually banned. So uh, first of all, just really, really uh, want to make sure that mm -hmm. uh, platforms like YouTube are there because they're there, there to serve the artists. And monetization is one of the only ways to make sure that you sustain yourself. And it's working out very well for artists. Uh, they're being able to monetize mm -hmm. their efforts and uh, because that's the only way you can make money. Either you uh, go live, you play, perform live, which yeah. you can't do in this day and age with COVID, or you monetize, monetize, monetize. So it is the bread and butter of many artists. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And uh, Sharyar, what do you prefer? Like playing live music, or do you like to work on the videos and you know recording music? What What are your preferences being a musician? You know, my passion is really to share my music with the world. So uh, uh, recording my music is really, really important and it's special to me. Mm -hmm. um, however, I am a very, very live kind of a musician and I just like to just bust out with my acoustic guitar mm -hmm. and play. So th that essence, I'm, I somehow am not able to reproduce in the studio. Yeah. I don't know how, why that happens, but I feel that I'm truly alive when I'm playing mm -hmm. live. And somehow that essence, uh, and it happens with a lot of great artists also, better artists who are so much greater than me. That's a, but so I would say mm -hmm. that I love recording my own music, but mm -hmm. but I also want to share it live. And so I, I hope mm -hmm. to perform more live uh, as you know with as right. time goes on. Um, right. it's, it's so a bit of both really, <laughs> a bit of both. Yeah. Right. So it means that you believe in creating fresh music. So, Sheryar, thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure talking to you. Same here. Thank you. Thank you. That was Sheryar Mirza on the underground music scenario. And that is it from the day. We will be back with some more content next time. Until that time, don't forget to share your feedback on the social media links mentioned down below and let us know what do you think. Take care and goodbye.